Friday. Okay, the boys and girls are dismissed into Children's Church. If you guys want to go up there, this is the right time. <laughs> well, thanks. I must stay there. I don't know. You might be the luckiest man in the world. I am. I am. I am the luckiest papa in the world. <laughs> I know. I know. I'm so excited about our church family. I'm so excited about the baptisms. Just remind you, people's lives are transformed by the power of Jesus. Yeah. Even coming from families where it's looked down upon and thought that there is no God. And who would have thought? Inviting somebody to church makes a difference. Let me tell you, it made a difference for me. Somebody in my teen group invited me to come. I didn't invite my teen group, but they invited me to come be part of it, so I did. It changed my life. It changed her life. If we took time today, everybody have a testimony, because it's really what happened to you. And uh, if you're not there yet, take heart. It's a prayer and a decision you can make that will transform your life and change you. You say, no, it's not going to happen to me. You never would. That's what she said. <laughs> That's what he said. Okay. Even if you have been brought up in the church and felt like, heard it, been there, done that, not going to affect me again. It will. It will. People are praying for you. They don't even know your name and they pray for you. Then they find out they're snoops. They find out your name, and they start praying for you. God hears that. Well, I have a story about a, uh, Jonah. I started to say a fish, but the water is inspiring me. Uh, Jonah is in the uh, Old Testament. You'll find him right after Obadiah. If you can find Obadiah, you're really good at this. But I'm looking at the prophet Jonah this morning. I didn't understand why because I was planning a different direction, and yet this is what the Lord keeps coming back about, so we're going to go there. Jonah 1.1 is where I'm going. If you're looking at a digital Bible, you need to find that, Jonah 1.1. I probably won't tell all the story because you know it so well. Everybody's heard of the fish story. I mean, knows that. But I really want to talk to you a little bit about something else happened to Jonah. I'm going to look at the first verse, first chapter. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Is that the way you say it? Amittal. It's like Barbital. I don't know. Amittal. What a name. Go to the city, that great city of Nineveh, and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port, and after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Well, then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose, the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. They threw the cargo over to the, into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he'll take notice of us and will not perish. Well, then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us who's responsible for making all this trouble for us. What do you do? Where do you come from? What's your country? What, and from what people are you? He answered, I'm a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. This terrified them, and they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked, what should we do to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will calm down. I know it's my fault. This great storm's come upon us. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. 
Then they cried to the Lord, O Lord, please don't let us die for, making, for taking this man's life. Don't hold us accountable for killing this innocent man. For you, O Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard. The raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. But the Lord provided a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. Well, I want you to notice something. God spoke to Jonah and said, this is what I want you to do. And Jonah was not necessarily a rebellious person. He was a follower of God, evidently a preacher. He wanted to do what God wanted him to do, kind of, except he had a certain limit. He said, I will walk with you, Lord, but I won't do that. There was a song years ago, popular, I'll do anything for love, but I won't do that. <laughs> Whatever that was, they never said during the song, but it was just that was the limit. Well, that's what Jonah was with this. Jonah was able to walk with the Lord when he wanted to go the way the Lord wanted to go. But when God was going a different way than Jonah wanted to go, Jonah decided he didn't want to walk that way with God. Now, the reason I emphasize that is because it applies to most of us in the church. We want to walk with God. We want to be godly. We want to make a difference in the world. We want to get to heaven. We want to be obedient to God. But sometimes God wants to go places that we don't want to go. He wants us to do things we don't necessarily enjoy, want to do. So Jonah, he decided, nope, not doing that. So we went down to Joppa. I've only been to the Holy Land one, one time, but we went there to Joppa, and we stood up on the mountain overlooking the Mediterranean there, and there's, it's a seaport, and you can see, the professor was showing us, you can see from that angle, large pillars of, uh, I don't know, it looked like stone, underneath the water where it had sunk down over the centuries. Those were the old ports of Joppa where boats had come in. It's where Peter was when he saw that vision of the sheet coming down and dropping down and all those unclean animals. And God said, let the Gentiles in. They're not unclean. But that was the lesson he was talking to Peter about. That was in Joppa. So he gets to Joppa and he, it's a busy port. Surely he'll find a ship there. And he did. And the ship was headed the opposite direction, down to Tarshish. Oh, that's a pretty good idea. I'll go there. I'll get away from God. I'll just get it out of my mind. I won't even think about it. I won't go there. And so he pays the fare and he gets on the ship. You know, we had the privilege of going to Jamaica and building a church down there. And the average temperature in Jamaica is 82 all year round. It's a palm tree growing outside the window where we went to sleep. Everybody that we met there was friendly and happy and glad we were there. It was just paradise, you know? <sighs> then we had to get on a plane and come back to Northeast Ohio. <laughs> and I was thinking, Lord, isn't there a ministry here in Jamaica you want me to do? Isn't there something you want me to hang out here for? Because even though I want to walk with you, I kind of like this over here and I could walk the other way. But this is my call. This is where I want, I'm supposed to be. So came back here. Jonah says, I like Jamaica. <laughs> going back there. He's, I'm going to get on this, this boat and I'm going to take another trip another way. And I'm not going to do what God asked to do. It wasn't because he naturally rebellious. He just didn't like the Ninevites. I mean, they were ungodly people. They were unruly. They were violent in nature. They didn't, they were where the terrorists come from today. That's the same bloodline, same idea. And like those people, they knew about God, but they didn't obey God. And he felt like probably that these people deserve what they're going to get. They could have made the same choices that we did, but they refused to. They went ahead and chose to live godless lives. They made their bed and let them lie in it. Kind of a self-righteous feeling, but he says, you know, 
They had the same opportunities that I've had, and they just chose wrongly. So let the chips fall where they may. So what if God destroys them? They deserve it. Sometimes in the church, we feel that way. We see people in all kinds of terrible, broken situations. And we smugly think, we had a choice. God brought us out of that. He can bring them out of that. That's their fault. They made those choices. They're going to hell on their own choice. It's not because we did anything about it. The Bible says Jonah found a ship. Let me tell you, there were favorable southerly winds blowing. There was a price he could afford. If you want to walk away from God, if you want to do something that God doesn't want you to do, if you want to choose a different direction, the devil will always make it easy. He'll always provide a ship. There'll always be a way for you to do that. You can rationalize. You can agree with other people. You can get off this ship of Zion and onto another ship. It's possible. He'll make it easy for you to do that. King David was on the throne ruling because God had appointed him as king of Israel. And his son Absalom, who was a good guy and friendly with everybody, and everybody seemed to like Absalom, he was going to be, he found a ship. He found some men around there that thought, you ought to be king before your time. We're going to fight with you. We're going to overthrow David, and we're going to make you king. And so they had a revolt and tried to overthrow his father David off the throne. It didn't end up too, one too good. Absalom ended up getting killed. There was another guy that got on another ship that was going to sail and, and that was available when uh, they run away from God. When I'm uh, thinking of Judas, one of the 12 that Jesus had picked and chosen, yet there was a ship that was available. There was a high priest and some friends of his around that would be willing to pay cash. All he had to do was identify who Jesus, which one Jesus was at a time when there weren't a lot of people around. Seemed like easy money. If you don't want to go and walk with God, the devil always provides a ship. You can always get on somewhere else and go a different direction if you want to. They'll always be easy. In fact, Jonah probably felt so comfortable with it. The Bible says he went down to the bottom of that ship and fell into a deep sleep. My problems are behind me. The Ninevites are nowhere in sight. I'm going to have smooth sailing from here on. But anybody that's ever walked away from God, which is most of us, understand the minute you begin to walk away from God, things get a little stormy. Things don't always go well after a few, after a few days, a few months, or a few years, and things start to be violently stormy. But you can find a ship if that's what you want to do. The second thing Jonah did was in the second chapter. It's easy, the book of Jonah. There's no exegesis. We just, each chapter tells a different part. The second chapter starts with this. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God and said, In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From the depths of the grave, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. Look down at verse 7. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord. My prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Jesus, <laughs> Jesus, Jonah prayed to Jesus, the Lord, and said, Hey, remember me? Have mercy on me. I'm changing my mind about all that you asked me to do. I'll pay my vows. I'll do what I said I would do. I will do what you want me to do. Sure enough, we call that repentance. When you change your mind and decide you'll go with God, what he wants you to do. And he repented. He so said, that's why I'm, I'm praying, I'm telling you. And look at the end of this second chapter. The Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. That was a stinky situation. I'm just telling you, where have you been? <laughs> you wouldn't believe it. Yeah, but he got out. God gave him a second chance. Can you imagine that? God gave him a second chance. Have you had a second chance? Sure. Maybe a third or fourth, fifth, sixth. I don't know. We'll all count. God is a merciful God. And look what he says. So then what did Jonah do? Third thing. Third chapter. Jonah, then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I gave you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Wow, he meant it. 
So he changed his mind. He goes and does what God wants him to do. The Bible says here that Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. Three days just to walk through that place. On the first day, Jonah started into the city, proclaimed, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, sat down in the dust, which is kind of a sign of humility. Then he issued a proclamation. By decree of the king and his nobles, do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Don't let them eat or drink, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may relent and with compassion turn away from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw that they, what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion, did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. So Jonah went, and he was successful. You would think that'd be a great day. You would think he'd be praising God like we did this morning. Nope. Fourth chapter, first verse. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? This is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for it's better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, have you any right to be angry? You see, all these people in Nineveh repent. They give up their evil ways. They give up their violence. And God has mercy on them. And instead of praising God, Jonah's mad. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. I knew what kind of a God you were. I knew that's what you'd do. I'd come. I'd show up. I'd do the work. And then you'd forgive him anyway. You see, Jonah went up on the hill and built a little shelter to watch because he was hoping for fire and brimstone. Sodom and Gomorrah, part two. Let's have it, Lord. Pour it out on them. And God didn't do that. You see, the problem with the Ninevites was not the only problem in the story. And God is merciful to forgive people who will repent and turn to him and give them another chance. But Jonah, he loves Jonah enough to give him another chance, not just to obey, but he's going to fix what's wrong in Jonah's heart. You see, in the church, we're big on doing the thing that God wants us to do outwardly. We're big at obedience. We want to do that. We want to be on his team. We want to be associated with him. So we'll do that thing that he asks us to do. Even if he had to twist our arm a little bit to get us to do it, we will do it. And when we do it, Sometimes our attitude is not good. We had a couple that came to our church, not this church, thankfully, but another church I pastored at one time, and they were trying to get off of drugs in their life. And they didn't look like churchgoers when they came in. She'd been raised in the church as a kid, but not much had sunk in, and quickly her family had got away from God and gone on that other ship. And she got all screwed up in her life and all messed up. So she and her boyfriend live in. Guy came with her. And uh, they wanted to be in church as much as they could. They needed everything the church had to give spiritually, encouragement wise, support wise, financially, anything we had, they needed. And uh, they came to the early service, like we have here. And then during Sunday school hour, they went out on the we had a porch out in the front of the church, and they smoked. And then we had the second service, and they came in and heard it all again, the second service. And some people in our church didn't feel like that quite fit. You probably remember this. Sorry, I got people from my old church here. Anyway, they didn't like it. And they came to me, and they said, 
preacher, you got to stop them from smoking on the porch of the church. It looks bad. We're in a big, you know, busy street. People going out here all morning, and there's our people out there smoking. And, oh, 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 oh. You know, and I said, you know. And my answer back was, that's okay. Don't you say anything to them. But they didn't fit. They didn't smell nice. They didn't look good. Bad image. And we had to decide what was more important. And that's what I asked them. I said, wouldn't you rather them be in church than anywhere else? Yeah. I guess. Well, the Bible says Jonah's sitting out there and God causes this plant to grow up in one day and it provides extra shade and now Jonah's happy. But God sent a worm to destroy that plant the next day and now the sun is being down, the east wind is blowing so strong and Jonah is miserable again. And so he says to God again, I might as well just die. This is pitiful. And God said again to Jonah, have you any right to be angry? Hmm. Look at the last part of the fourth chapter. It says, and, and this is nervy, but Jonah is like us. He said, I do. I'm angry enough to die. But the Lord said, you've been concerned about this vine, though you didn't tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and it died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who can't tell their right hand from their left. As many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about this great city? You see, what God's trying to help Jonah with is he's trying to realize what's temporal and what's eternal. What's important and what's not important. He said, you didn't do anything with that vine to grow up. You didn't do anything for it at all. It's just all extra. I did that for you. And I took the vine down. But you see those 120,000 people? They're like sheep without a shepherd. They don't have a clue. And when they did repent and come turn to me again, that's what you're here for, and that's the important part. But in the church, sometimes we get that confused. Sometimes we get all excited about the vine Those people are going to leave a stain on the pew. <laughs> Can't stand their smell. It's all over their clothes. You have to discern, folks, whether you want the vine or whether you want the 120,000 people to come to God. I know it's on my mind because I saw the lady last night and she went back to YSU and got her degree and wrote... Married a guy, and not the same guy, but married a guy, and finally got him saved too, and now they're raising their family. And I'm thinking, you know, they're more important. I'll tell you another story. I heard of a large church, but when they're in the beginning days, they weren't quite as large as they are now. It wasn't thousands of people, it was hundreds of people. And the senior pastor said, I saw a couple of our associate pastors after church because we had some kind of semi-celebrity people come and some very wealthy people that we knew were wealthy in the city. And there was a ball team there in that city and they would come and players would come. And he, he said, I noticed after the service, these, these two associate pastors of mine would hang around with them after the service, you know, just because they were who they were and they had money and all those things. They were just enamored with all that. They wanted to be seen with them, wanted to be friends with them. He said, but I noticed they always gravitated to the same people and all the other people didn't get that same thing. So he said, I've been praying about it and praying about it. How can I you know, talk to them about this in a way that will be redemptive and help them understand? He said, we're having a little meeting one day, a staff meeting. He said, I went out to get some paperwork and there was a lady in the foyer and I asked her, hey, how can I help you? I didn't recognize her. I hadn't seen her before. And she said, well, I need the Lord and I thought maybe a commence pastors could pray with me here. He said, you bet we can. He said, just a moment, let me go tell my other, I got a couple other pastors here, we'll come out and pray for you. So he went and talked to the other two pastors. He said, there's a lady out in the foyer, and she wants to be saved. So we're going to go out there and pray with her. If 
but I want you to know before you do that she has a tremendous net worth. She doesn't look like it. She's not dressed up that way today, but I, I will tell you after she leaves how much her net worth is. So they went out there with him, you know, and were all excited about it. And he said, they were falling all over themselves, you know, trying to help this lady to the Lord. And, and certainly we prayed with her, and she got saved, and everybody rejoiced. And she walked out of the church. We walked back into the meeting. And they said, well, what's her net worth? Well, how much is she worth? Which, what, how much is, what, what is she, wealthy? What? He said, yes, she's worth the blood of Jesus. It cost God his only begotten son to buy her. And he said, never had a problem after that. They understood. But sometimes in the church, Christian people who love God forget. Our perspective gets off. And we begin worrying about the vine instead of Nineveh. And there are people around us all day long who are ungodly. Some are even violent. They don't have even the basics. They can't tell the right hand from their left spiritually. And you are dropped into that place at school or at work or in your neighborhood. And you've got to realize they're more important to God than the little comfort that grew up over you for a few moments and then went away. And we get mad. I had a truck one time that didn't, air conditioner didn't work. I didn't like that truck because I like air conditioning. I want creature comfort. Isn't that nice? It's hard to go out and visit people when you're sweaty and get out of the truck and you're all, uh, I didn't want that. That wasn't the most important thing. Those people's souls were the most important thing. Sometimes God just has to remind us it's not about the vines. It's about the Ninevites. Jonah wasn't wrong to say the Ninevites were bad people. They were. That's why he had to go. God never tried to step in and defend them. He never tried to say, you're wrong, Jonah. They're wonderful people. No, they weren't. But they were people that could repent and come to Jesus. So I will tell you, if today you like God, you might even love him and appreciate him for what he's done on the cross, and you're walking with him, and he wants to walk a different direction, you still have a choice to make. You're going to walk with him, or are you going to do what Jonah did and walk your own place? I don't like those people. I don't want to go there. That's not convenient. That's not easy. There's no air conditioning, whatever it might be. Or are you going to go ahead and obey? And if you've been walking away from God against light, then I got good news. You can repent. And God could change and use you, and you could be obedient to him. Then you've got to discern what's important and what's not important. Okay? And some of the stuff that comes into our life that we really like and that we really appreciate is not important. Not eternally. You see what I mean? So don't spend time griping about the carpet or the whatever lights or the paint or whatever you think is the vine. Those are all temporal things. One day they're going to be all gone. But what you do for God that will change people's eternity, that's going to last forever. So God didn't just save the Ninevites. He saved Jonah. There's this verse. You know, the book of James, the New Testament, is considered the book of wisdom, like the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament. But it's a lot shorter. It's easier to read. When you get to the last verse of the fourth chapter of James, you'll find this verse. To him that knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, it's sin. So when Jonah knew what God wanted to do, but he refused to do it, that was sin. When you and I know we need to speak up, we know we need to invite somebody, we know we need to love on somebody, we know we need to do something to help them, and instead we don't. We do our own thing. We didn't do anything yet. Jonah never carried a sign around the end of a bunch of losers, a bunch of sinners. He never did that. He just didn't do what God wanted to do. And I thought, well, man, that's a picture of the church. I don't care what church you go to. I don't care what age it is. We can be guilty of that. So I thought, well, maybe God wants us to learn from Jonah's example so we don't have to be swallowed up by fish. 
vomited up on the beach. Hey, there's hope for you and me. God may have a more direct path of just reminding us and dealing with our hearts. But if today you could be in one of the boats in the situation that some of these people were when they gave their testimony, and you need to come to God, you need to have a come to Jesus moment. You need to come and tell him, I'm sinning, I'm wrong, I need your forgiveness. Maybe you've said that, and God said, okay, walk with me. And you said, okay, as long as it's where I want to walk. But as soon as he took a turn you didn't like, you said, but I think I'm going to get another ship. And you're running from God, and you're not happy. You're miserable. There's a storm in your life, and you wish that it was different than it is. I got good news for you. You can repent, and God will take you back. I like that about our God. He's merciful. He's compassionate. Possibly. You're in the last chapters of Jonah, and you're doing what God wants you to do. Outwardly, things are going to look good, but you know in your heart you don't like people. You know in your heart you're not happy because they're sinners and they deserve to go to hell. And let me remind you, I read about you in the Word and about me. It says we all have sinned and deserve to go to hell. It's only by the grace of God that we are saved. Not of works, or else we'd be boasting. Okay? So, if somebody had not come to you, if somebody had not prayed for you, if somebody had not, you did not go seeking God out, no matter how it looks. The Holy Spirit came seeking you out. And you might think that storm was a bad way, but it certainly got a hold of Jonah's attention. And not only did Jonah get turned around, but every ship on, every sailor on that ship, the Bible says, they feared God and offered sacrifice and made vows to him. So just think, if you start doing what God wanted to do, other people around you might get involved too. They might want to do it too. Your influence is big when Jesus is in it. Let's stand for a moment and let me ask you to pray. I've been watching this thing the whole time, Chris. Isn't that cool? I think that's really cool. It's got all these Bible verses his family made for him and his name and the date are there and everything like that. I've been watching that because you can't see it over there, can you? Okay. Isn't that cool? Cool. What's cool about it is it represents something. It represents it's a monument. It's something that represents something else. And some of you need to have a monument in your life this is the day when I stood up and said yes to Jesus. This is the day when I got over myself and started doing what God wanted me to do. This is the day when I quit being petty and started being practical about the eternal redemption of souls. This is the day when I stopped worrying about little things that don't matter and I started paying attention to who does matter. This is the moment. Erect your monument. Put it down. Say, this is today. This is what I'm doing. There's a place of prayer both sides of this altar, for you to come and pray. I don't care why you come to pray. That's not my business. That's yours. You might just need prayer today. You might just want to pray to God, talk to him. But if you're in the Jonah story somewhere along the way, I'm not even going to ask you what it is. You just talk to God about it, would you? Chris Lee's going to sing or lead us. I don't know what you're going to do. What are you going to do? Let's just bow our heads and ask God. The reason I only ask you to bow your head is not secret. I just know how many distractions there are. So just talk to God. If he's telling you, this is my time, come and talk to him. Everybody needs prayer. This would be a good time to pray. Trade these ashes in for beauty.
beauty and wear forgiveness like a crown coming to kiss the feet of mercy I lay every burden down wouldn't that be good news at the foot of the cross you can lay every burden down at the foot of you know our lives we want what you want forgive us when we get off the path forgive us when we take another ship when we decide it's easier to do what we want run away some people in this crowd might even be running away from a call from you maybe you're talking to them maybe you're calling them and they've said no they're going to go a different direction maybe Lord there's something that we've forgot we knew it but it just kind of didn't seem as important. We let it go by the wayside. And now we're worried about every little thing and no big thing. Oh God, help us to major on the majors and minor on the minors. Fill us with your love and your power so we go out into this world that's so crooked and perverse, we're going to shine like stars in the universe holding forth the word of life in our desires to serve and please you. So wherever that takes us, Lord, help us to have courage because you always guide us and lead us, protect us wherever you send us to go. We want to be obedient. Bless these folks. Their hearts want to do your will. May we humble ourselves and let you do the leading and guiding in Jesus' strong name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You don't have to shake hands if you're afraid of the virus. But smile at somebody real big. Make them know you're happy they're here. <laughs>